Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 20, Child's Play, part 2. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We're live here every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of the feedback we've received, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. So first up, some feedback from our last episode on date night games, or games for couples, two-player games. Brett Slocum on G Plus writes, My date night games are guillotine and any of the flux games. Also, chrononauts. All right. Well, thanks, sir. Brett? Now, Samantha Bryant on Me We writes, When my husband was still my boyfriend, he won me with a series of two-player games, Lost Cities and Balloon Cup were two early favorites. I'm still a sucker for a beautiful theme. Carcassonne was how I learned that I love tile-laying games and anything with meeples. <laughs> Must love the meeples. Uh, thanks for the comment, Samantha. Uh, I was her comment that made me realize that I completely forgot about Lost Cities when I wrote the original blog post, and that's why it ended up in the podcast. That was, uh, that was a game and she Games and I played back when we were dating. So maybe that's a tip for you guys dating. Play Lost Cities. That seems to lead to good things. Jeff Boyt writes, Tokaido, Lords of Waterdeep, and Scrabble work for us. Well, thanks, Jeb. I think Scrabble is always a favorite. Uh, I know there are some people who may not feel as comfortable with, with big word games, and that's, uh, that's something you need to judge. Uh, and then Tokaido, I know a friend of, a friend of mine, uh, Windsor Gaming Resource, had written that uh, she just found Tokaido too zen, uh, playing its uh, uh, two-player with her uh, her partner. So, you know, your uh, your mileage may vary on, on Takedo. Now, up next, we have some feedback on our look at Dominion. Chris Groff on G Plus writes, I took a similar break from Dominion, partially from playing it a lot, but just generally a case of the new. But with every deck builder, I still compare it to Dominion, and while most have introduced some new twist on it, I still maintain that for balance and pure engine mechanics, none are better. Lately, I've been itching to play it again and introduced it to a couple of friends who had never played it before, and they loved it, and I loved it again. Felt like the first time relearning combos and building an efficient engine. Still a fantastic game, and still one of my top games of all times. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, I do admit that does tempt me to play my copy at least once more. Prayerborn on Twitter writes... Per your point on the podcast, at our church's board game night last week, I was able to painlessly teach Legendary to two gamers because they already knew Dominion. Same has held true in my experience with Clank and Ascension. He then later followed up with another tweet. For Mrs. Prayerborn and myself, Legendary, and to a lesser extent Clank, fired Dominion from our deck building niche. But we still break it out from time to time. Well, thanks, Prayerborn. It's great to hear that... Uh... You're, you're branching out and teaching uh, more players and bringing them into the fold. Uh, I know a lot of people are, are slowly sort of moving away from Dominion, but uh, as some of our other comments have said, every once in a while, it's nice to look at it fresh again. Now, Duran Barnett had a rather comprehensive comment on the review on tabletopbellhop.com. I'm so glad that you did this re-review because for the longest time, I felt so alone crazy. I had played quite a few deck builders before playing a friend's copy of Dominion, and I was seriously underwhelmed. It felt so old, clumsy, and, in all honesty, boring. I remember getting so frustrated with having to play cards to give me more actions. Why can't I just play all my cards, darn it? <laughs> I met two guys last week who are both really into Dominion, but have never played any other deck builders, and whose broader gaming experience is limited. And that's just the thing. I really think if you've played anything else, Dominion just doesn't hold up. It reminds me of a shut up and sit down discussion on if chess was released now, how would it be reviewed? Board gaming has moved on and Dominion hasn't. So what would I recommend? Well, Star Realms is pretty tight and cheap to get into. Any of the legendary games are great, especially the Marvel ones and Clank has quite an interesting and enjoyable spin on the genre, although it can be sometimes a bit frustrating. 
I do have a special place in my heart for Core Worlds because love the idea of marshalling armies and conquering a galaxy. I've also had loads of fun playing Arctic Scavengers, even though I don't think I ever won it. These last two, I think, have loads of potential for re-exploring and re-skinning. Wow. Well, thanks for that in-depth reply, Duran. No, you are not alone. And I assure you that it's not just you and I. I know many local gamers who feel the same and feel no real need to play Dominion again. But then I know other locals who are more like Chris above who still enjoy and play the game. That's the great thing about this hobby, right? Not every game is for everyone, but there's pretty much a game out there for anyone. Also a great list of alternatives. Now one tip, if anyone does pick up Core Worlds, you have to get the first expansion. The game literally is not complete without it. There's stuff actually mentioned in the rule book that say, ignore this symbol, it'll be coming in the expansion. If you get that first expansion, it gives you a full complete game. Now I'm not gonna comment on whether that's how companies should or should not be marketing their games, but it is the fact with Core Worlds, pick up the first expansion Galactic Orders for a full game experience. I don't know, it sounds a lot like a, uh, a certain magic book for Warhammer that didn't come out years <laughs> and years ago. Well, that's, that's it. True, I finally have a copy of that. Well, that's it for feedback this week. Thanks to everyone who took the time to email, reply, and comment on our posts. Yes, thank you very much. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhops Tabletop? Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at TabletopBellhop.com. So, still not getting in as much gamey as I'd like, but uh, I think it's just it's getting close to the holidays. There's lots of things going on, and obviously I haven't been feeling great, and the whole illness seems to be passing around the family. Little G had something cleared up, now she seems to have something else. But we did have an awesome day on Saturday. So Big G had a concert. My mom agreed to watch Little G. So Angie Games and I had the day to ourselves. And we took full advantage of this. We started off at Kigeru, Kageru Ramen House for some ramen to start. And oh my god, they're, they're still as good as, as ever. Solon definitely knows how to make a bowl of noodles. I'm actually trying to figure out when I can get my son down. As he has somehow become interested in the uh, idea of ramen. Uh, okay. But unfortunately, he has a low, really low spice tolerance. So I'm hoping we can get Solon to sort of say, here, here, you know, try try this that, that's not going to kill him because he's he, it's a really low spice tolerance. So trying just sort of a generic one is, is bound to hit a, a, the level of spice that will bother him. Okay. Well, the one we tried on the weekend, uh, NC Games and I both got the same one, was Miso Ramen. So the main flavor in it is like miso soup, and it's got zero spice. Right. The main taste in it is miso and corn. So it's, a, it's a different flavor. You might, he might want to not eat the chasu, the rolled beef, cause, or rolled pork, because the rolled pork's got some flavor to it, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, it's worth trying. So after ramen, we headed down to the CG Realm local game store and met with one of the owners. So we're looking to sell off our Magic the Gathering card collection. Big G needs braces. Little G has some special testing we want to get done that unfortunately isn't covered by our wonderful uh, free healthcare program we have up here in the north. Yes, not everything is free. Uh, so we're hoping our old card collections will cover the cost of that. The wonders of parenthood, combined with the wonders of CCG valuation. God knows the comics that we had back in the day are no longer worth a dime. No, we tried that one. I remember we took a trip up to London and we brought Dee's, Deanna's entire uh, Elf Quest? comic book collection oh, and we I'm couldn't good. even get anyone to take it. Like, I think the best offer we got was 50 bucks for the trunk full. Like, yeah. And we're like, but this one comic's worth at least 50. And they're like, no. Yeah, I remember. I mean, I had I had a number of of collectors mint in bag, uh, bought you know carded comics, and the value of them just dropped. I don't know. Yeah. At, at some point in my life, you know, that when I wasn't paying attention, comic books just became useless. Well, no, and, and any of that are valued have to be graded, and you got to spend money to get them graded, and only certain ones are worth getting graded, and yeah. it's a mess. Like, at this point, our comics are for our kids, and if they don't want them, we'll probably donate them. We actually gave a bunch out for Halloween last year. Yep. So, after talking about cards and prices and money and budgeting and all that fun stuff we decided to stick around because this saturday was the second saturday of the month which is the tabletop game night at the cg realm now that doesn't start till five and it was mid-afternoon so it's just 
the two of us for a while. So we started off with Azul. And luckily, you've got the new Joker tiles to bring in a different twist and uh, keep the game exciting. That's true. So, you know, we talk about Azul a lot on the show, and it seems like we play a lot. I would have said we play almost every week. Well, I guess it's not quite as often as you'd think, because when I got ready for last week's podcast, the date night episode, I was making the stack of games that I put behind me there, and I couldn't find Azul, like anywhere. I looked, Enchi Games looked, my kids looked, no one could find it. And then Enchi Games had the bright idea to check Board Game Geek to see when the last time we played was. Well... As much as I have trouble taking Board Game Geek stats people really seriously sometimes, at least if you record all your gameplays, you can see exactly where you played last and start your search there. That is exactly true, and that is exactly what I did. And I saw the last time I played was November 3rd. November 3rd was Extra Life. So as I noted in the recap episode, lots of people played my copy of Azul at Extra Life, and somehow it must not come home with me. So I got a hold of Ian at CG Realm, and sure enough, he's like, oh, that solves that mystery. We've got a copy of Azul that's been sitting behind the counter for about a month, and someone had left it behind. Now, thankfully, I did have those Joker tiles, so it was easy to identify my copy, because as far as I know, I'm the only one local who's bothered to pay the money to get those shipped from the manufacturer. Now, on this, I have to say, business cards. I can see why you wouldn't want to damage or mark or, or, you know, in any way mark up anything of your game as an identifier, especially if you're someone who might be reselling at some point. Even if you're not the tabletop bellhop, <laughs> throwing some uh, business cards in there will help them at least call you up and, uh, you know, give a check and see if it is. It might be yours. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually, especially I bring a lot of games to local events. Normally, it's not a problem. I bring one milk crate, like four games, and I'm not going to forget one of those four games. But for Extra Life, I think we brought seven milk crates full of stuff. And there were all kinds of games, and I had piles on three different tables. So it's definitely not a bad idea. Plus, if other people are going to use my game, then they'll see my business card. Of course, then they may take it out, but I'll put multiple copies in every box. So it's a good way to market the brand. <laughs> So now we had our copy of Azul back and she games asked to play because she hadn't gotten to try those cool new Joker tiles. So basically the Joker tiles are really simple. They're clear, really beautiful tiles, actually probably nicer than the ones that are in the base game. Really cool looking tiles. When you're drafting, you either take a Joker tile or you take a Joker tile and another color. Other than that, it's exactly the same. When you're placing them down on your pattern, it has to go in a row with other tiles. Or if you have all, this, all Joker tiles could fill a row as well. So if you already start with all Joker tiles, you could technically add any color to the end of the row. The thing is, the Jokers bump to the front of the row. So when you're actually placing them on your board, the Joker tile has to go. It can't be one of the, the colored tiles. Then scoring is exactly the same as in the base game. The only thing is the Joker tiles aren't considered part of a set of five of the same color, which just makes sense. So you're still scoring horizontal, vertical. You get points for you know the Scrabble scoring, and then you get points for a complete row, points for a complete column. Your Jokers count for all that. They just don't count for the I have five of the dark blues because, well, you don't. You have a Joker tile instead. Well, and they're a really interesting aspect that can uh, shift your strategy and make tracking your opponent's strategy that much harder. Yes. Sorry, I'm going to be drinking more liquid tonight than usual do this. So one of the things I hadn't realized about the Joker tiles is that you have to adjust how many are in the bag depending on the number of players. So with four players, it's fine. You just use all of them. And you first time you get them, like when I got them, you pull out four of every color. So you're pulling out 20 tiles, putting 20 new tiles in. Nice and simple. And the next time you go to play, you just those tiles are separate and you play. Well, with less than four players, you have to adjust it. And with two players, it's only five Joker tiles. So that is a little, I'm not a big fan of having to sort through my tiles now every time I play. I got to dump both bags out and sort them out and pull out so many and put so many in. Like, that's not going to be a problem since most of the time we probably are going to play four players. But I'm kind of bummed that Azul is no longer pick up and play. Like, I now have to do some sorting and I'm probably going to have to look up in the rule book at least for the first few times, to remember how many Joker tiles to put in. Like, I know four is all and two is five. Off the top of my head, three, I'm going to guess, is 10 and or 10, 15. And See, I don't even know. No, I actually I have, I have no clue how many you would pull out in between. Uh, see, I'm thinking that, uh, to me, it makes more sense that as you're packing up, you pull out all your Joker tiles. Uh, and that way, yeah. when, when you sit down, how many people do we have? This is how many we throw in. It just seems like it's, it's, a, it's a better flow than trying to sort through it at the beginning when you're all sitting down ready to play. But it's not just throw in. You also have to take out. 
you have to take out an equivalent number of equal odds of the other tiles. Uh, so uh, you're not just tossing in 20, you're taking out 20, oh, and with right. four players, that's four of each color, right? right. Like, it's it's harder so you don't have to do well i mean i suppose you, you could, could take out all the jokers and then you, you you take care of that part of it and then when you start you just have to put in the colors i wonder i wonder if there's a box insert where you can pre-sort everything and just have everything out pre-sorted and you only throw and you only bag the ones you need prior to the game yeah maybe i i don't know i like uh, i play the game enough but i don't I, it doesn't take that long to sort it no. just slightly late it's just because the game was grab it play yeah like it's not like, I'm complaining about this, but I'm about to talk about Terra Mystica in a little bit. <laughs> you want to talk about setup? We'll like, get to that. It was all, it was nothing, yeah. right? We'll get but to that But it's just like, shortly. oh, man, Azul used to be the game that I just literally threw out on the table, put out the tiles, here we go, bang, go. I can't yeah. do that anymore. Yep. So the other thing with uh, four players, when you're using the Joker tiles, you put 20 of them in there. Because there's 20 in the bag, they come out all the time, right? So there's almost at least one, often two on the same market. There's usually multiple markets that have them. With only five at two-player count, it was like we never saw, like, our first hand, I think we had three out. Then we didn't see any again until two came out on the same tile. And most of the time when they come out, they're only once on a market. So the other thing it means is if there's only ever one tile, one joker tile on any individual market, they're never going to cycle, so they don't go back in the bag. So you're only going to see them that first round through. So they are a, a huge skew to the original game, um, and but they do make you think that much more, especially if you don't know when they're going to show up and, and they're harder to plan for, which just, again, makes that uh, the strategy, both yours and judging your opponents, that much harder. Very true. So other than those minor complaints that I, you don't see enough of them at two player and the fact you got to sort everything, I do really like the Jokers. I like that they add the game, add to the game without changing how it feels. It's simple to teach, like I told you the rules, just like drafting any other color. Uh, what I'm not sure is if it makes the game easier or harder. Like you'd like to think that throwing Jokers in would make it easier. You're like, well, I can just mix and match. This is going to be so much easier to complete my columns. But no, it's not though, because now you have new options and do you draft the Jokers? and oh you get you could get stuck with jokers right like you can still screw your opponents and make them take a joker and make them screw up a pattern that they would have got five of a time like based on my score the last game i'd have to say the game's actually harder with jokers because i played terrible well you know it's it's one of those things where i find that game can sort of really flex and like i know the last time i played i think i just about doubled your score um, yeah. and, and that was a, a fluke thing. I mean, I don't, I don't consider myself a great Azul player by any means, but I, I got in a rhythm and the scoring worked for me and, you know, yeah. I did really well that game. So I think there's a bit of, of rhythm to the tiles and, and just sort of catching, you know, getting that right, the right start that is going to allow you to run through the numbers and, uh, and pull out that big score at the right time. Yeah. Maybe I'm just terrible at Azul anymore too. <laughs> <laughs> So at the point we had finished playing Azul, it was still pretty early. Like, I think we had an hour and a half before game night was supposed to start. So I broke out Terra Mystica, and we are going to play entry games, and I'm going to play a two-player game. Now, I've been itching to play my physical copy after playing multiple rounds on Board Game Arena. Uh, you know what? It's, you know, we, we've been playing a lot of Board Game Arena, um, and it's, again, it's, it's nice to have a, a physical game every once in a while, you know, especially when you've got gamers present. Yeah, see, Angie Games hadn't played in, in years, like literally years. Again, I could probably look up on Board Game Geek and figure out at least the last time I played, and she probably played too, but maybe not. Uh, so we broke out the standard setup, right? Like, So in the rule book, there's a first time you play play with this setup. So we did the two-player one. We did the set board placements and the set bonus tiles for the two-player game. Uh, you play Nomads and Witches. I took Nomads. She took Witches, which worked out really well because she likes to play green. I like to play yellow. And that they happen to be green and yellow. And then we used the, the – everything was recommended, right? Like the recommended startup. You know, it's it's a good way, even if you aren't a new player, even if it isn't your first time through, going through those tutorial games is just a great way for everyone to get a refresher of the rules and get back into the swing of a game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Now, the first thing we learn, and this goes back to Azul and setup, is the huge, massive advantage Board Game Arena has is that you click start and the board set up. 
there are a lot of little bits in this game, like a lot. And then not only are the little bits, there's a specific place to put all the little bits. So you have to take all your settlements. It look like settlements from, um, from Catan and they all have to go in the settlement spots. And then all your trading posts have to go in the trading post spot. And then your temples have to go in the temple spot and a stronghold has to go in its spot. And the sanctuary has to go in its spot. And each of these covers up something on the board. And the way a game works is when it's on the board, that's uncovered. and You get that for income when it's covered. You don't get that income. So, so they have to be there, right? Like it's part of the game that ever you can't just like make a pile of your settlements. It doesn't work. And I am sure they exist that there's like an overlay like I own for Terraforming Mars, which would probably make things a little smoother. But I don't own that for Terra Mystica. And I got to say, it probably took us half an hour just to get the game set up. And then I had to reteach NG Games how to play. So I'm thinking we probably spent about an hour just getting this game set up. It's definitely not one of those games we've recommended on date night or bringing out oh, to the cafe no. in prior episodes. Uh, it is no, just no. peace management. Yeah, I got to agree. I see NC Games is noting in the chat room that it, an overlay would be very nice for this particular game. I think if the boards are generic enough that you could just do a generic overlay that would fit on all 14 of the different faction boards. I, I think it, it could be very useful. So I've talked about Terra Mystica on the show a couple times. One of the times I mentioned it was in our teaching episode, and that was on the list of games I hate teaching because there are five different ways to score points in the game. There are eight different actions you can take on your turn, and you just keep going until everyone passes. And then some of those different actions have sub-actions. For example, spending power, you're going to spend it up to six different ways. Now... Each of those individual actions is pretty easy to grasp. And the way I like to think of it is like each little piece is a small, bite-sized, easy-to-digest thing. But once you put them all the plate on, on a plate together, that's just too much stuff. It's easily overwhelming. Yeah, a lot of moving pieces for a board game with literally zero moving pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Like... Once we got playing it all, it, it sunk in. I, w I would say it probably took Enshi Games two to three rounds to fully grasp all the different moves and what they do for. Um, I do remember there was one thing she misunderstood that actually affected her play choices, and that kind of sucked. Uh, it was the fact witches could place houses everywhere and didn't have to be adjacent. Now, to me, that's a uh, significant data point. Uh, and she games is a hardcore gamer with plenty of heavyweight games behind her. So to hear her taking that much time to grok it, uh, it just tells me that this is a tricky one to pick up, even if you've played it before. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Like one of the things she kept repeating while playing, and I've said it before, is "Holy cow, this game's tight." It's one of those games where you never can do everything you want to do, but it feels like you need to do everything. So it never feels like you have enough workers or not enough money or not enough priests or you're falling behind over here. And how do you stop that? You're going to fall behind somewhere. You can't do all the things. To me, actually, that's a sign of a great game. So by the end of the game, she must have rocked everything well enough because she won. I personally spent way too many points trying to get power because you can spend XP to get power. And I was way too worried about the four elemental tracks. So you said priest to the 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 temple of fire earth wind and water and i spent way too much time over there on the board and i thought i was going to kill it on end game scoring but i forgot about the fact that second place also scores right so i'm like i'm going to get first and everything which gives me eight points in all of them so eight times four 32 points then i'll catch up well i wasn't thinking about the fact that second place also gets four points so i'm actually only gaining four points on each track so that was my fault i i misread what i was going to get at the end of the game I was like yeah i can spend points i got lots at the end and, and that doesn't surprise me, at least, because that's just how Angie Games rolls. Even if she was struggling to pick up the game in the beginning, <laughs> she just comes out and slays everyone. She doesn't win every game, but she is definitely good at playing Euro-style games. This type of engine-building game is pretty much her cup of tea. So overall, I really enjoyed playing my physical copy. It had been a long time. Like, playing on Board Game Arena is cool and all, and I love having to not set up the game and take it down. But it's also nice that NG, that NG Games, oh, sorry, Board Game Arena tracks your points, right? Because it's easy to mess that up. Like, I'm sure I'm, I'm not that good at basic math while playing games. I'm focused on other things where sometimes she was supposed to get five points. I marked four or the other way around. I, it's easy to make mistakes on that. There's a lot of different things. But I really dug the physical feeling of putting your stuff out on the map. And when you upgrade it, taking that small settlement away and replacing it with a bigger piece, that just felt more like you were actually building something and you were actually growing an empire. 
This this is where we need to get uh, AR so that we can do an overlay. <laughs> you actually move the pieces around, but the AR overlay calculates your score real time for you. Yes. Because uh, it's, really, be nice. it's really easy to underest underestimate the tactile aspect of our hobby. Uh, when you play a lot of digital games, it gets away from you, the speed, the convenience. It's hard to, hard to turn those down. Uh, but there is something real about holding and moving things. Yeah, talk to any role player about dice and using a dice app or rolling physical dice. I don't know a single gamer that prefers an app. So what I've got to do now is play Gaia Project again. So the whole thing that drove this whole me playing Terra Mystica was I played Gaia Project and I did a first impressions review. And at the time, I'm like, ah, they seem really similar, but I haven't played Terra Mystica in a long time, so I should play it. Well, now I went out and I played a ton of Terra Mystica between Board Game Arena and Real Life now. And now the problem is it's been a while, so my memory's fading on Gaia Project. So I think what I need to do is a double header where I play both. But unfortunately, I don't own Gaia Project, so I'm going to have to hook up with someone who has a copy so I could do that. And that sounds like a very long night. <laughs> uh, not too bad. I don't know. It's it maybe six hours, three hours each time. So Terra Mystica took, I don't know, it took a bit longer than we expected, mainly because of setup and takedown. So by the time we'd finished, people had showed up for game night. But I don't think we were that far in. I think it was like maybe 5.30, maybe 6. It didn't get that late. So with having to relearn the game, it I don't know. I'm, I'm going to guess two, two and a half hours, maybe three. It depends how many people you play with, too. So now that we had other people showing up, we set up Terraforming Mars with Venus next and recruited a couple other local gamers. So we had uh, Ian, who works at the store, and I feel so bad. The guy from Saskatchewan. Yeah, Saskatchewan. Guy, local guy, found the Windsor Gaming Resource on Facebook, started coming out to local events, has been out almost every local event, into heavier games. I really enjoy playing with this guy, but I cannot remember his name. I apologize, dude from Saskatchewan. So this game of Terra Mystica, we played the full-on Corporate Wars version. So all the cards, um, zero starting production. Uh, we drafted corporations. Everyone got two corporations, had to pick one, got your 10 cards, had to spend your money to buy them. The only thing we didn't use is the drafting variant where we pass the, the cards between each other when getting new cards during the rounds, which I'm kind of glad we didn't. I'll get to that. Now, one player had played Terra Mystica once with a beginner corp. That's Ian. Like, he, he had his, had one experience with us playing where we let him do the beginner corp, and he really liked it. He's like, yeah, I can see why you dig this game. Now, the second player, this guy from Saskatchewan, had played Terra Mystica a bunch, or sorry, Terra Mystica, um, Terraforming Mars a bunch, and knew it well, but had never tried Venus Next. For Angie Games, it was her third time, and for me, it was my second time. I'm interested about your uh, your uh, thoughts with the additional plays behind your belt. I mean, we've talked about your initial thoughts on the game and, and, and how it felt that first time out. So uh, it's interesting how that the, the feeling has evolved now that you've played it a couple of times. Yeah, it's definitely changed for me a bit. And she games is pretty much on the same boat she was originally for anyone who's listened to past episodes. So what we did see this game that felt very different from the other two I had played was literally the first half to maybe 60% of the game was all about Venus. Like, basically, everyone ignored Mars. And in Venus, you're trying to terraform it. And the top level you can get to is 30%. Well, we had it probably 20% complete before we had a single tree on Mars. Uh, this meant everyone's terraforming rating was in the 30s before people even started terraforming Mars, which I thought was rather interesting. Interesting. That That's a, a very different experience for the game. And yeah, it, it definitely changed things up. And then, of course, the second half, or, or like I said, maybe even the last quarter, I couldn't judge exactly it, how long was a mad rush on Mars with uh, O2 and Lakes being played like crazy. Now, he kind of went up all game because we had um, Ian was playing Thorgate, which is the company all about power and electricity, of course, and they generate lots of heat. So he was steadily raising the heat. That went up like a normal game. But like that's the O2 level in the lakes, like just flew out. Like it really like it felt like the game ended two turns faster than it should have because it was just like by the time we focused on Mars, like bang, game's done. We're like, wow, I didn't even have a chance to play this 33 card I'd saved in my hand and I had this big plan for this and wow, I didn't get to do any of that. Which is an interesting statement because 
I was not a short game at all. Like, like we were at it for almost four hours. Like, this isn't like the, the game of Terraforming Mars that never ends at our launch party because people are talking. Like, th at this point, I've got to say Venus Next makes the game longer. Every time we've used it, it's been longer, and this is the longest yet. Now, we were at the store. We did stop partway through to get Coney Dogs because you have to. And Ian was running the store, so we did have to stop, step away a couple times to deal with customers. But I would still say it probably took us 3.5 hours if we took out the interruptions. And that's with not the full player count. That's with only four players and four players who knew the game. There was no one brand new in this. Now, considering the volume of content that's been added by uh, Venus, it's not a huge surprise. But I think that's something that whether you want that for your game or not is going to be up to each individual group. Just be aware if you're going for this, uh, you know, if you're going to add a, a lot of cards and a whole other play board, there's some time hits involved with that. Uh, random scrub is pointed out. I, keeps, I just finished talking about Terra Mystica. I should never talk about Terra Mystica and Terraforming Mars in this short a time together. They both start with T and M, I guess, and my brain gets confused. I do apologize. At this point, I am talking about Terraforming Mars with the Venus Next expansion. And I will spend some time on uh, the, the audio editing <laughs> this week, I guess. I know at least once I caught myself, but it, it's, I must have missed it another time. So, so far, I continue to enjoy Venus Next. I love seeing new cards. Like, that's the biggest thing for me is I'm still seeing new stuff. And I haven't had that experience in Terraforming Mars in months. Like, I get a hand of cards and every, I'm like, oh, wow, a card I've never seen. That makes me happy enough that I'm happy just seeing new stuff. Um, now, what was cool was my corp was a new Venus Corporation. But it was focused on Mars, which was cool. Like, it gave me um, greenery to start and stuff that's Mars building. And what happened was I got two mega credits every time anyone else did something on Venus. So it was cool because I got to basically sit back and go, you guys have all the fun over there and focus on something else and get rewards for other people focusing on that. I, I enjoyed playing that corporation. And it also let me focus on a money strategy and, and let them do their own thing. Now, NG Games still thinks it waters down the deck, and this time she played a pure Venus strategy with a pure Venus corporation, and it was the one that let her start with three extra Venus cards at the beginning, and she did win. Now, I will note by one point. I was behind her by one point, which to me still validates it all because she could focus totally on Venus, and I could do the whole, you play with Venus, I'll play with Mars, and it works. And like I said, if I had just not messed it up, couple little things there was one point i should have grabbed the milestone i didn't that would have gave me the game now the player who had played terraforming mars before uh multiple times liked the new stuff but didn't have a lot to say about it he was just like yeah i like it this new stuff now the last player ian didn't really have enough xp to be able to say one way or the other he played the original with a beginner corp and now he's played venus next well, it seems uh, like it or not, she's at least working it out, uh, at least with that one corp. It seems like it's that same Venus corp that she's got that she uh, slayed with both times. So uh, that could be a balance point. Uh, I wonder if there's uh, an advantage to uh, that that, uh, one corp. that particular corp. At this point, Venus next, I, I say try before you buy. That's all. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Tonight, we've got uh, Teldern, Steve, Major Kayla. Uh, thank you, Random Scrub 23 for dropping in and uh, correcting that little uh, TM short-form problem. Always appreciated when we to help us out. Yeah. Uh, and there's a few other uh, names in there I don't recognize, but I haven't seen them speaking up. I did notice Rand was, I missed who said it. I think it was Steve who noted we could do a, a, a mobile games library. And I'm like, that's that's kind of what I do when I go to the local game stores. So when I go, I usually bring two milk crates along with me with, you know, four to five games in each, depending on what I really feel like playing. Plus, I like to have games there for other people to play. So I tend to bring stuff like Azul just to have it there if other people want to play it. And there's been other games like Onitama I've brought and uh, other stuff that I tend to just have on hand. For a long time, I always brought Catan just so there was a copy there. Now I do that with Terra Mystica. I, oh, I see, I did it again. Now I do that with Terraforming Mars. I don't do that with Terra Mystica. Now I do that with Terraforming Mars where it's just with me. And that way other people have played my copy. I can teach my copy. Pretty much everyone local knows how to play it at this point. So yeah, we do kind of do a mobile library. I have thought about trying to figure something out where we could rent out games, but it's something I want to work with uh, 
probably the CG realm to see if it's a possibility as as a way to get the games out to people so they can try before they buy. Just need to find a way to do it where the games don't come back in bad shape, or if they do, we have that covered somehow, or we budgeted for that potential. You can find us all across the web now, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform and help us spread our gaming advice advice to the world. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday or so, we will be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, podcast episodes, reviews, or anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, for those of you listening to the podcast, I do want to take a moment to thank everyone who not only entered but chose to follow our various online accounts. I hope all of you found something worthwhile at Tabletop Bellhop and choose to stick around after the contest is over. So the holidays are coming up quick, ridiculously quick, especially if you're listening on the podcast. They're even sooner than they are now. If you're still doing your Christmas shopping like me, or if you're still looking for gift ideas for the gamer in your life, uh, if you're looking for gift ideas that are not just games... Your game friends likely buy many of the games they want for themselves. And buying something they'll enjoy or don't already have in their collection may be tough. This is a list of items that make great gifts because there's things people may not be buying for themselves. Just head over to TabletopBellhop.com and click on Gamer Gift Guides. While there, I also welcome you to check out the hottest online game deals by clicking on Tabletop Game Deals. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send questions to questions at TabletopBellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, TabletopBellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works great, too. Uh, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. While I prefer if questions come through the web page because they're easier to track that way, I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, except for G+, in a couple of months, because that's going away much faster now. <laughs> yes, in April now, if they don't move it up again. Now, back in July, when this whole thing was just new, we answered a question from patron Brian Kurtz about the best cooperative kids' games. We covered that on episode two of our podcast, which you should be able to find in our backlog. Now, you can also get our past episodes like you can get them on your our podcatcher, right? Everything should still be there. It's all still in iTunes. You should be able to go back or you can go to tabletopbellhop.com forward slash podcast and get a list of everything we've ever put out. Now, today on Ask the Bellhop, we are asking a direct follow up question to Brian's original question. It comes from Duran Barnett, who asks, What about doing an episode on introducing kids to gaming? Or maybe a direct sequel tackling non-co-op games for kids? Well, thanks for the follow-up question, Duran. Now, this is a question near and dear to my heart. While I'm no child psychologist, nor would I say I'm an expert at gaming with kids, I do have two girls, age 8 and 11, who I've been trying to share this great hobby with as long as they've been alive. So everything we talk about here tonight is based on my personal experiences trying to introduce my two girls to the wonderful world of tabletop gaming. I've got a young uh, boy and girl myself, and I've watched a couple of uh, great women developing under the guidance of the Bellhop and and she games, and uh, I've played a couple of games with uh, the girls myself now that they're getting a little older, and they've clearly got at least a hint of that gamer desire in them. Yeah, very true. We're trying. So I'm going to start off it's in the first part, right? Introducing your kids to gaming. And then we'll get into a bunch of game recommendations. And like most of the game recommendations we've done, we'll break them into categories. The whole thing we've done, pretty much every board game recommendation episode, uh, though there's a bit more to this one with the intro. Uh, we're going to do it this time based on your kids' ages. Now, age recommendations are unfortunately a necessary evil. Uh, as a parent, no one knows your kids as well as you do. Uh, the levels of their ability and their comfort. For instance, the industry says that after three, small parts are okay and the choking hazard is passed. But any parent knows that that is essentially an arbitrary age, and it's really up to the individual parents to choose what is best for their children, regardless of what it says on the box. Very true. Now here, too, I'm not going to talk about specific ages. We're going into, um, like, I don't know what I word that. Groupings, not like age three and up. We're going to talk about toddlers, preschoolers, and so on. But first, 
getting your kids into gaming. So the biggest thing, like anytime you're trying to do anything with your kids probably, is patience. So this is both in getting your kids to actually sit down and play at the table and once you're there. Expect resistance, expect fidgeting, short attention spans, wanting interest. If your kids say no, don't try to convince them. Don't bribe your kids to play. If you're in the middle of a game and they look bored, offer to stop. Take a break. Just because you start a game doesn't mean you have to finish it. A lot of gamers seem to have a real hard time with this concept. This is not just true with kids. If everyone's having a bad time while playing a game, stop. The game police are not going to break down your door for not completing that game of Blockus on time. It can be better to have a game that only ever goes one or two turns and then you walk away. But everyone walks away feeling like they had fun rather than yes. fighting through to the end and everyone being grumpy about it at, uh, and not wanting to play again. Exactly. So, like, I read and hear horror stories all the time about parents who try to force gaming on their kids and how it's backfired, right? They force their kids to sit down because Wednesday night's family game night, we're going to sit and play kid, play games tonight because that's what we're doing as a family. And the kids end up resenting it, and I don't blame them. Like, they make their kids, I've seen people who make their kids play RPGs before their kids are ready. And instead of a fun time, it's more of a fight and an argument with the kids. Some parents turn gaming into an obligation instead of a fun activity. And that's the big mistake and the one I don't want to ever make with my girls. Your kids are their own people. No matter how much we wish they were more like this or that, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, they are what they are. And we can't force them into a mold that's going to do anything other than cause pain to them or and or us. So the first step is to make getting a game exciting so for us that was we save up the games for like birthdays christmas special occasions right like birthdays and christmas being the big ones sometimes a good report card but the thing is we want it to be exciting we want it to be oh look new thing not just oh here here's another whatever here's another board game to put on the pile uh yeah seeing seeing others get excited about games as well um, excitement is, is something that's, uh, infectious. And if you're always talking about looking forward to gaming and having fun gaming, your kids are going to pick up on that. Even if you never actually discuss it with them, they, they feed off that emotion from you. Yeah. I bring that up a bit later too, and a different reason for why I think playing games that are fun for adults fits as well. So I'll get back to that. So the follow-up to getting the kids excited about the games, right? It's Christmas morning. They're all excited. Um, play the games, right? Like, play the games while the kids are excited. No kid should have a pile of shame. No adult should probably have a pile of shame either, but, you know, most of us gamers do. But definitely not. There's no reason your kids should have a big pile of unplayed games. You want to strike when the iron's hot, right? So when my girls opened King of Tokyo Christmas morning, we're all excited to play. We actually took a break from opening gifts to open the game so they could look at the components, sneaking a chance for me to get the rules so I could read them. And then once we're done the gift opening and we had our breakfast waffles, yes, that's tradition here. We have breakfast waffles on Christmas. I offered to play King of Tokyo. And we played two or three rounds that very day and the kids loved it. So it was an instant gratification now. They're excited about the game and they got to play the game while they were still excited. You didn't give them a chance to cool down on it. Yep. You know, kids, kids love the excitement of opening that present, tearing off the wrapping or however your family may do it on, on whichever occasions. But opening that box further, taking the next step and letting them see the parts, explore the boards, look at the art and or put things together if they're able to can really help build their excitement and get them more and more interested in moving on. Uh, likewise, if they're if the ccgs card games are there are there a thing opening up that deck of pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or whatever the hot new game is mm -hmm. and letting them look at the art on those cards and 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 really sort of feel like it can be a part of something they like so the other thing to look at is the opposite side right if they're not excited or looking to play don't force it on them don't be like it's christmas day you got this game this morning we're gonna sit down and play it like, especially a day like Christmas or birthday where they're getting lots of gifts, maybe the game you're really excited to share with them isn't the hot thing for them that morning, which is cool. Let them play what they want. Hopefully they'll return to the game later. Timing is everything. They may love the game, but they may love the shiny new X from their best friend that much more. <laughs> Very true. 
So that brings me to the next point. Like, we don't do a family game night, right? So there's no set time to play games at our house, at least with the kids. Now, as adults, yes, we have to schedule things because we're adults. And if we don't try to get together Monday nights at 8 o'clock, we'll just never get together. And heck, as it is, we don't necessarily get together on Monday nights. But as far as when your kids with your kids i don't like the whole we play every wednesday right but there's no reason not to suggest playing games right like hey tonight after school when you get home do you want to play some board games or how about this sunday we're going to do a no screen sunday no tv no netflix no video games how about we play some board games instead again remember to accept no like if the kids say no i don't want to do that well that's fine that's their prerogative it's you're not just don't force it on them you don't want to make gaming an obligation you want it to be something fun and something they want to do like like no screen days um while they can be great they should be an established yes. idea you don't want to accidentally end up uh board gaming as being a punishment like if you've got if your kids are grounded from from screens or devices that's not the time necessarily to bring up gaming. If they want to bring up gaming, that's great. But you don't want to make that as a, oh, I'm punished, so I'm going to do gaming, uh, board games instead because I can't play the games that I want to do. So you really have to balance that uh, that sort of thing as well. Very true. Very true. So in most cases now, having done what I've mentioned already, I let the girls come to me. So sometimes this is direct, where they'll literally come to me and say, hey, Dad, do you want to play this? But more often, it's indirect. And what I mean by this is they come to me looking for something to do. Like, I'm sure every parent out there has heard many times, I'm bored. There's nothing to do. And that is when I bring up gaming. Hey, you're bored. Why don't we play Kids at Carcassonne? I haven't seen you play that in a long time. Or how about when I'm done this blog post, we'll break out Oak Fox? Right? Same as before. Don't push. But just suggest games when it comes up. And if they're not interested, that's cool. And if they are, you get to sit down and game. And you have to remember that sometimes a game may just end up being a long-term investment, just like the rest of parenting. Uh, if they don't want to do a game that you thought they'd be ready for at five or, or would be interested in, maybe eight will be better. Or mm -hmm. maybe one of their friends will come over, see the game, and that will spark the interest. Uh, I, there are so many things that I can see with that when, when, when the kids have come over to, the friends have come over to play, something that my kid has never shown any interest in at all has become the hot new thing because that friend knew about it and wanted to play it or didn't know about it and wanted to play it. Mm -hmm. And that brought them into it. So sometimes uh, inspiration can come from external uh, causes. Yeah, we've had a uh, big G brought some games to school one day and they went over so, so she was more excited than her friends were because they're, Friends, of course, are all into the mass market games because that's all they know. Right. Now, what's great is as the kids get older, they, especially mine at least, I assume everyone's would be like this, is they'll just set up a game and play by themselves. So now you have a chance to take part. So you can show up and like, hey, I see you're playing this. Can I play next round? Or sometimes, I got to admit, it's nice to see my girls playing together by themselves and not fighting. I'll just leave them to it. But same deal. Don't just sit down and assume they want you involved, right? Ask and then respect their decision. Rules about the game. When they're playing, this is, you know, let them use their own. You play with, mm. you often play with house rules in your games. Let your kids play with house rules too. They may not work and it may be a complete disaster. And as a parent, you may know it's a complete disaster, but letting them learn that on their own is such a major part of parenting. Yes. Um, so don't, if, if you really like to play that game by the rules, let your kids not play it by the rules. And if it doesn't work, then you can sit down and talk with them about why it didn't work and, and why the, game, the rules might be what they are. Use it as a teaching experience. But give them the chance to play it however they want to play it. Unless you see them putting money on free parking, stop that right then and there. <laughs> so, in summary, uh, make gaming exciting... <laughs> An exciting, fun activity, right? Don't force it on your kids. It should never feel like an obligation. Suggest it when you can, but let the kids make the final decision on when it's time to play. So far, that seems to have worked really well in our family. And again, you know your ch children better than anyone else. And uh, it's, it's up to you to make those final decisions. Uh, and all we can do is offer you a few suggestions that have worked for us and uh, a few ideas we have about what might uh, help you in this path. 
So the next important thing for getting your kids to enjoy gaming is to play fun games. Because there are a ton of kids games out there. The problem is that not a lot of them are actually games. They're actually activities. Now, I'll admit, I fully admit, these activities do teach important things. They teach things like taking turns, counting, pattern recognition, memory, um, all the little vital things that kids do need to learn. Things like taking turns. Uh, it's all important. But a lot of these aren't games. For me, for a game to be a game, there has to be a decision to be made. In a lot of these games, the results are purely random or predetermined before the, even game, the game even starts. Like, there is a popular game out there that once you shuffle the cards, the game's set. Like, now you're just going through the motions. Now, while these activities have value and teaching kids these things is valid, I don't see why you can't have the best of both worlds. Why you can't use actual games that teach those same skills that are actually fun and have real decisions that have consequences. I'm impressed. You didn't actually say it. We all know you meant no, Candyland. We all know you meant <laughs> Candyland because you've called it out by name many times. Uh, it, yeah, it's my kids loved the Candyland, and it was specifically because of the theming. Um, and to be yeah. honest, I don't think my kids would be interested in playing uh, games like Clue or other games if they hadn't sort of started by playing a game that wasn't a game. So I, I, I do differ from you a little bit on this one because these are, for little kids, gateway games into gaming, even though they, they aren't technically games. I mean, we, we all know this. But for the kids, they feel like they're playing something. They feel like they're accomplishing something. And they are getting into the idea of playing games without having to worry about the actual, uh, you know, thinking and, and, and fighting through it. I don't know. I'd, I'd still argue there's probably a better game than Candyland out there to teach the exact same things. It's still a game. Because the other reason I think it's important that you're playing a game is they're actually fun for adults. Like, I'm not even trying to be selfish here. It's the thing you mentioned earlier about how if the adults are having fun and the adults are engaged and the adults are enjoying the game, the kids are going to feed off that. If you are engaged, it's more likely they're going to be engaged. And it's really hard to stay engaged and act like you're having fun when you're just playing through an activity that you realize is ultimately pointless. Well, I have to say, uh, the Candyland was one that my kids were always happy to play on their own. They never actually really invited us to play. So... Well, so I guess that'll work in that way. I don't know. I'll get to one. There's this game Monza. I think Monza is the better candy land, but then it doesn't have cute candy houses. So theme is important. That is something I will admit before I go on, because up next is the actual game suggestions. Um, the bellhops rule is in full effect here, right? So the game that gets to the table is the best game for your kids. So if your kid really wants to play a game about werewolves, maybe you should go try to find a werewolf game, even if it's not very good a game. Right. So that that is a very big thing with kids is theme. Right. Like if your kids in general, you're going to find generic fantasy and sci fi is pretty simple. But if they're into something a little more obscure, you're going to have a hard time finding games. You may have to stick with a Monopoly version of that movie they love to watch every weekend. Just I do suggest don't do the free parking thing and teach kids about auctions at an early age. And maybe they'll learn that Monopoly actually isn't as bad as some people make it out to be. Yeah, I you know what I I think there's there's something to be said as far as I'm concerned about uh, some of the theming stuff. You know, if your kids are Disney fanatics, buying a, a cheap and dirty mass produced game that's got Disney is a way to get them into the games uh, that is is sort of guaranteed to catch their attention because they're already hooked on that product line. Uh, yeah, and then it becomes a really easy pivot towards you know gaming is fun. Well, why don't we try this one? We're starting to see more mass market licenses put into better games. Absolutely. I haven't seen it as much with the kids' games, but like there is a um, – this isn't on my list because I don't own it, it but it's supposedly really good. Is like there's a the, Save the Pride Lands, which is a whole – I want to say African Lion Safari. That is not the movie. The movie was Simba the Lion. Lion King. Lion King. Lion King. Thank you. I'm like, there's this Lion King one that's actually, actually supposedly really good. I know there's one based on Frozen that's supposed to be good. I haven't tried a lot of these. My kids aren't big Disney fanatics. Like, they dig Disney, but they, they take it or leave it. Yep. They'll, they'll do just as well with Gobos and Trolls. So, Well, you know, and if your kids love zombies or goblins, 
great. You know, yeah. again, go with their what they like. If you're the kids like mermaids, you know, as we've as we've talked about on other episodes, yes. you know, there are games out there to fit mm-hmm. their enjoyment. You know, what whatever it is they already like, and it's a great way to start uh, start them. So on to the game suggestions. So one of the things I'm going to note right up front here: every game we're going to talk about tonight is competitive. Players are trying to win individually. If you want a nice, solid list of co-op game suggestions, you're going to have to go back to episode two of our podcast, and you'll find a great list there. But here's the final tip. Just buy Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. It's fantastic. Best, one of the best co-op games I played, and it's a kid's game. Just grab that. You can ignore the rest of the list. You'll be happy. This Christmas, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters for the win. It's, it's fantastic for young and old. So we broke My kids were list. actually playing it today. <laughs> So we've broken the list down to games for toddlers, games for preschoolers, early grade school games, pre-reading, and mid-grade school games starting to read or, or reading. One final disclosure, every kid is different and has different interests and learns at a different rate. It may be that your little one started playing Power Grid at 8 or could still be struggling with reading at age 10 and still gets great joy from Goblet Jr. You know your kids better than we do. Yeah, we've said it a few times now. We are not telling my recommendations are based on my two girls. Now, my two girls are completely different from each other. And I kind of think in my head that if I mesh the two together, I get the average kid. I may be wrong on that, but just by how different the two of them are, I think that kind of works. So starting off with toddlers, some of the first games we got our girls, um, actually, when I bought the first ones, it was just one girl, uh, were these wooden box games from Blue Orange Games. Blue Orange makes fantastic games for people of all ages. These are colorful, compact wooden boxes with all wooden components. Um, Three of our favorites of these were Ben Domino Jr., which is a really basic domino, domino style matching game where you just build on one end or the other. You can't branch. It's just you go left or right. And it makes a still snaking line of tiles first one to play all their tiles wins. Uh, one called Bingery, which was a really good combination of bingo and memory. So you had to flip the tiles, but you were trying to find the things on your own player board that had four specific things you were looking for. So just that step above the basic game of memory or the step above bingo by where you actually have decisions. Uh, the last one is Goblet Jr., which is a tic-tac-toe-like game, but your pieces are three different sizes. And you can play them on top of other people's pieces. So again, it's tic-tac-toe, but it puts that step above, and you're actually teaching your kids not only memory, but planning ahead and um, tactics, because when someone plays, you can totally change what you're going to do next. Really, at this age and at this uh, stage of development, you're looking for shapes, colors, Things you can mm-hmm. grab, large things you can grab and tactilely uh, interact with, uh, whether mm-hmm. it be stacking or moving. Those are really the keys you want to look for. Yeah. The other company that was big for us back then is Haba. Actually, they're still big for us. Now, this is a German company that started off just making wooden toys, high-end wooden toys, and then got into high-end board games that, of course, have lots of bits of wood. Uh, the best of these games in this group is Monza. This is my kills... Um, color game that I'd seem to not want to Candyland because what you have is a racetrack and you have an oval and on it is a grid and there's all these different colors. There's actually six different colors and you have a set of dice and the dice have those six colors on the sides. And what you have to do is roll the five dice and then spend dice to move. Now, this is a great teaching game because you're teaching colors, you're teaching pattern recognition, you got the taking turns. But the thing is, it's also adding pre-planning and actually basic statistics and odds. Like one of the best dad moments is hearing my oldest, Big G, say, well, I could move here, but instead I'm going to move there because if I'm there, there's a better chance I'll roll red or white than if I move there where I can only move on yellow. Like hearing like a six-year-old say this, you're like, oh my God, you, you get it. This is awesome. You're not, th- there are actual decisions and they can figure it out. Now, you're not going to lose the game if you just spend your dice, whichever, oh, I can move red, blue, green. Okay, red, blue, green, and I'm done, right? But you can get that uh, emergent play where it clicks into the kids that, wait a minute, there's a reason I might want to save my red for next turn and stuff like that. Really fantastic. Uh, I would almost say underrated game, but then every best Euro board game list for kids is going to have this game on it. But like, no, no, it's it's not mass market. I wish it was. This game should be available everywhere. Yeah, no, it's great when you've got those games that are simple and fu- but simple and fun, but also have that much depth where... Your kids may, may just enjoy it for what it is, or they have the opportunity to make those big learning leap moments. 
Exactly. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking for when I'm teaching my kids games, right? And it's, again, it's more fun as an adult to play a game where I have decisions to make instead of I just move my pawn X spaces. So another great one from Haba that I personally think every gamer should own, even if you don't have kids. And this is Animal Upon Animal. This is a dexterity game with odd-shaped wooden animals. You roll a die to see which animal to place, and if you play all your animals, you win. Uh, it's really basic game, but, like, oh, the kids love playing this game. I love bringing it out to the local game store to play with adults. And, wow, going back to our episode about games to play at bars, here's a great one. you got big wooden bits that are easy to clean, and the game just gets harder as the night goes on. I don't know. I maybe I know this is a kids episode, but animal animal upon animal with big easy animals that are easy to clean. I just don't know if we're going in the right direction there. <laughs> Perhaps I don't know. I still think it's a fantastic game, and the, the kids don't actually laugh when they put the monkey on the other animals' back, but right. the adults do. And again, you want the adults to be laughing and having fun, and then the kids will laugh too. It's right. all part of the enjoyment of the game. It's 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 like the good older Disney movies that threw in the adult jokes, and no one really caught them. Absolutely. Pixar to the rescue. There we go. Yes. <laughs> so here's the obscure one. This is, I, I think in every group, I've got one that's a little hard to find. So this is a game called Flower Garden. This is a big wooden box just filled with bits. There's long wooden stems, round flower buds, uh, petals, leaves, and then all these bits to make a caterpillar made up of wooden beads and a shoestring. Now, all of the bits for making the flowers are magnetic. So you can actually stick the petals on the flowers and everything. It's a really simple game where you just roll a die to see what you can build. And the goal is for each player to build a complete flower. So a flower has, I don't know, five petals and two leaves and so on. But there are not a lot of decisions to make in this game, but there are some. Do you hurry up and finish one flower? Do you split your flower between the two? Um, that's not the main reason I'm recommending this one. The main reason I'm recommending this one is the component quality of this is amazing and the kids spent hours and hours playing with the pieces from this game so not only is it a fairly solid game that's okay to play with the kids as an adult but man the, that box of bits had so many hours of play time in it well wow, that's that one sounds great and i hadn't heard of it uh and she games is mentioning that ebay germany is about the only place to uh grab that right now so really ouch <laughs> Yeah, and I know, so again, some of the games I recommend are older games, a little harder to find. But wow, I didn't know it was that hard to find. So now on to preschooler games. So again, Blue Orange Games. Blue Orange Games is going to come up multiple times on this list. They make good games for a large group. So Goblet Junior we talked about. Well, there's Goblet. It's basically the same game, but now it's a 4x4 four four grid. Once you go to a 4x4 four four grid, just like when you expand Tic-Tac-Toe to 4x4, four four, it becomes a much better game. There's a lot more interaction. There's a lot more going on, and you hardly ever get a tie. So this just makes it a better version of Gobble Goblet Junior. It's Goblet, the big version. Uh, another one, which I really want to call Froggy Boggy, is sadly named Froggy Boogie. I don't know why they didn't call it Froggy Boggy. It's just a much better name. But it's a very cute dice-based memory game. You roll dice to determine which frog you've got to look at, then you pick one of its two eyes. And one eye will let you move your piece, the other eye will make you, you can't move forward. And it's a race to get around the track. So it's memory, but then there's a couple little things in there to mix it up, which I dig. Um, it's not... A huge game, but my kids love the components, and they ask to play this one over and over and over. Interestingly, uh, if you Google Froggy Boggy, Tabletop Bellhop is one of the top lists. Uh, top uh, <laughs> hits. <laughs> <laughs> That's I can't complain about that. <laughs> there we go. Um, another another I guess great we did good SEO with Froggy Boggy. Uh, another great uh, thing for toddlers, and this is a new a board game. But my recommendation for when you're out at the restaurant. Go for the connect the dots. Try and move them away from t the, the tic-tac-toe. But uh, at the preschooler level, they should be already, they, you know, if they're, if they're uh, comfortable enough, start for uh, working on uh, connecting the dots and, and trying to fill in the boxes rather than doing tic-tac-toe. You're talking about squares, right? Squares, dots yeah. and squares. Yeah, dots and yeah. squares. Much, yeah, we started that one as early as possible. Yeah, much more enjoyable than the tic-tac-toe. Yeah, I agree. Though my kids still play tic-tac-toe all the time. We try to guide them, but sometimes they don't listen. <laughs> so um, we already talked about uh, Blue Orange. So next, again, I got Haba again, because Haba, just like 
Blue Orange makes fantastic kids games. Uh, they continue to be popular, possibly even more so once we get into this age group. Uh, one of them, my kids' favorite games that, again, I found out in the Florida this morning is Rhino Hero. This is a fantastic dexterity game with a superhero theme. You're building up a building and moving a little rhino meeple up this house. And the cool part about this game is it actually involves a hand of cards. So you're getting to the point. It's only a hand of three, but the kids are learning to hold cards. And then after they build a level, they're going to play one of those cards and it's the roof. And depending on which roof, roof they play it changes the rules somehow so it might change the turn order from left like clockwise to counterclockwise which doesn't matter if you're playing two player or it might be play again or it might be move the rhino and moving the rhino means the next player has to find the rhino on whatever floor he's on and put him on the top floor so it adds a not only stacking dexterity but also the the fine dexterity of having to pick this little rhino meeple out and put him higher up on the building this one is a ton of fun with adults. The only thing with this game is once you get good at it, you basically have to move it to the floor because you get way too tall on a table. And, like, I've got pictures. I'm like, man, what were we thinking where my kids are, like, standing on a stool on the edge of the table trying to play Rhino Hero? And I'm like, wow, I, my kids were more brave back then, and I was more uh, trusting in them because now we play on the floor. So another little tip, uh, and this isn't, uh, this isn't a board game, but a great tip that I found early on. Uh, my family really loved to play Uno from an early, early age. Uh, but with Uno, you get a lot of cards in your hands. And my son, yes. my son, who is to this day pretty tiny, um, always had trouble holding enough cards. Well, if you take two CDs or DVDs or blanks, you know, I mean, everyone's got extra DVDs and things laying around these days because no one uses them anymore or even has a DVD player. Uh, and if you just glue together the bottom half, it becomes a fantastic card holder. So it's just basically cool. you glue down the, the two, two CDs back to back, uh, and, but only along the bottom half. And then you can just slide cards in the top. And it's a fantastic way to hold a lot of cards um, if they're having trouble uh, with the dexterity portion. And you don't want them laying them down all the time because everyone can see what, they're, yeah. what they've got. Yeah, my kids I have always had a hard time with cards for some reason. I know there's enough like mass market. You can go buy card holders everywhere, Etsy and so on, but that's a good idea. I'm sure I have CDs somewhere that I haven't used for bases for scenery. There you go. So another great one from Haba is a cat and mouse game called Gary Gouda. Uh, this is where you are moving a mouse around this house into different rooms. And you're trying to sneak around and eat cheese without being spotted by the cat. Now, Haba has some brilliant components. And this is a great example because as you eat cheese, your mouse gets fatter. And the fatter it gets, the less archways it'll fit through. And you don't know that until you try to go through. And there's a way to randomize it up at the beginning of the game. Like, this is an amazing looking game. And it's a great introduction to push your luck mechanics and consequences. If you eat too much cheese, you're not going to be able to get out of the house. And components are, like, top notch. This is, it's not a cheap game. It's also not a small game. I don't know if you can see it behind me, but it's the biggest box back there. And the box is the board if you looked inside it. Now, interesting, uh, at this age, would this be a good age to get into something like Can't Stop for uh, Push Your Luck? I could see that. As long as they can do the basic counting, you might have right. to do the counting for them. Right. But if they can count the pips on dice, there's no reason you couldn't do Can't Stop. There we go. So going back to cat and mouse games, the next one, this goes to uh, this Rio Grande games originally, now it's Eggerspiel puts it out, is a game called Viva Topo. This is a race game, and this is the game I recommend to replace Trouble and Sorry. Because the big thing in Trouble and Sorry is you roll dice and you have multiple people or m multiple pawns, and you choose which one to move. Well, Viva Topo has that mechanic. You have, I can't remember how many, five or six mice. So you have a bunch of different mice, and you roll, and you have to choose which of your mice to move. Now, in this case, the pieces aren't pawns. They're these awesome little wooden mice with tails and plastic ears. And you're trying to move your family of mice around the board. And at the corners of the board are houses that have cheese. And if you duck in, your mouse is out of the game, and they eat the cheese. Now, while the first house only has one piece of cheese, the second house has, like, three pieces of cheese. The next house has six. And if you make it all the way to the middle, you reach Cheesevana, and you get an entire wheel of cheese. So this is the whole 
you're mitigating risk, right? Because every time you move, there's a chance the cat moves. And if he catches your mice, they get no cheese. And at the end, you count up how much cheese your family got. Like each mouse can only get one cheese. You're trying to decide, do I duck into a house now or do I, can I make it a little further? Do I leave one mouse behind for the cat to catch? There's a lot of decisions here. It's teaching you pre-planning, push your luck, um, strategy. You're doing math. You're looking and it actually teaches fractions because the pieces of cheese are part of a full wheel. So they're little pieces and you put them together and the three pieces, of course, three stuck together. Plus, it's so damn cute. That's uh, that's an interesting one. I, I had not heard of that one. Uh, that should still be around. That one you should still be able to get because I was looking up for a cop. That's how I found out a different company put it out. So a few companies do kids versions of adult games. You see that quite a bit. Uh, the first one we actually picked up and tried out was uh, my first Carcassonne is what I wrote. But that's not right. It's kids of Carcassonne. So Kids of Carcassonne came out from Real Ground Game. It's a tile laying game like the original, but with bigger tiles. And all you care about is roads. So all you're worried about is you play a tile. And if you completed a road, you put your meeple on it. And that's it. That's the whole game. First person to play all their meeple wins. Very simple, but it does give that feel of Carcassonne. Uh, this is one kind of like the, the Games Workshop games I mentioned last week would be cool for... If you're playing Carcassonne, hey, you guys could play your own version. I think it'd be kind of cool for that. This is one that I do still find the girls playing on their own. I personally think they've outgrown it, but they keep playing it. So every time we get around to, hey, we're going to donate your games, we're going to make some room for new games. I'm like, you want to get rid of Kids of Carcassonne? They're like, no, no, we love Kids of Carcassonne. So I'm like, all right. Yeah, no, it's great. And it's always amusing to find what it is that, that becomes the lasting game. Uh, I know that most of the things that I think would would go are the ones that end up staying and having the the most lasting power uh, in their collection so mm -hmm. we just let them go with it and uh you know sneak thing sneak things out if we notice it hasn't been played in a long time and <laughs> try try not to uh encourage too much outward discussion because uh that'll guarantee it becomes uh, at least a favorite for at least a couple of days to prove us wrong yeah, as soon, as soon as you say it's going to go, of course, it's yes, yes, it's got to go. It's, usually if we use the angle, we need room for more games, that usually tends to work. Right. It's like, hey, Christmas is coming. You got no room on your shelf. I don't think Santa's going to bring any games if there's no room on your shelf. No, that kind of thing. So now we're going to go to something very silly. Uh, it's a game called Loop and Louie. This is the closest game on my list that's more of a toy or an activity than a game. There is some dexterity required. Um, I kept this on the list because it's so much fun, uh, not just for the kids. Like this is you've got this plastic biplane flying around. It's counterbalanced and you have a paddle. And when you hit it, it kind of flips up in the air, does all these loop to loops. and You're not sure where it's going to come down. And you got these little discs that are chickens. And if it bumps all your chickens, you're out of the game. And you're trying to hit the thing up in the air to hit other people's chickens. Uh, it's silly, but oh, my God, is it fun? Like I only picked this up because the Dice Tower used to run tournaments of it at cons with adults like this isn't it's a kid's game it, it's cute it's it's rather fun uh they even put out a three-player version this year with a star wars theme and you can now get loop and chewy we don't personally own that one because it only plays three people and often when we play this we do play with four people instead of three yeah no this is uh this is a hard one to turn down it's it's uh it's a it's great fun game uh, and another one at this point, uh, just before we get on to your last discussion there, is one thing to consider, depending on the level of um, dexterity and agility of your child, and one that can help with that, is, is believe it or not, Twister. Um, I, you know, <laughs> may, may not consider it a board game, but Twister is actually great for developing uh, gross motor movement, uh, balance, and, uh, and agility. So if that's something that... Uh, your kids uh, enjoy working on or need to work on, uh, Twister is a good time uh, for this this age. And adults can have fun with it too, and I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> yeah, that is something totally different. What I thought was really cool is they came out with a new version of Twister this year that is accessible for blind people, and I thought that was awesome. Oh. So they've actually put the, pips on the colors so you can you can feel it's, your it's colors. Not, it's symbols or something, okay. but like, yeah, they put stuff on the board. And the point that you're supposed it's supposed to be twister blindfolded. But the fact you can play it blindfolded makes it now accessible to blind people. Absolutely. Which I thought was really cool, actually. I was really impressed by that. If I was ever gonna pick up a version of Twister, I would probably pick that one up. Uh just to note, the uh the loop and chewy is uh apparently uh low quality. Really? So that's disappointing. The yeah. original is, is surprisingly good. 
There was a guy local, and you can here you go. If you go on Shapeways, here's your next level tip. If you buy two copies of Luke and Chewy and go on Shapeways, you can actually get a new base for it, so you can set it up to play eight players. It's something I've been very tempted to do because I think being able to play with eight adults at an event like Extra Life would be fantastic, especially throwing that buck in to get an extra chicken and stay in the game. I think I think that would be a great one. So I did mention that pretty much every one I'm going to have something obscure. I, this may be the last obscure one, but here's the weird game of this group, and it's a game called Maskinball der Kofter, uh, which translates to Ladybug's Costume Party. This is obviously a German game that you can get over here that is about pairing up ladybugs by matching the spots on their backs so you have these little wooden ladybugs and the spots are little wooden tubes that you can swap up and then on your turn you're going to swap to and then see if the if the ladybugs like it and they have magnets in them and they'll either turn away from each other or look at each other like we called it the ladybugs were kissing i don't know i don't think it actually said that. i think they're supposed to be dancing uh, this one's really cute like overly well produced wooden components really neat bits there's these big ant-like creatures that show every time you fail if too many ants come up they interrupt the party uh the thing with this one though is we got this when my girls were young right so this is preschool they haven't even started school yet and they loved it at first but then eventually they got older and figured out that it's just a puzzle and they solved the puzzle so every time they play now it's just a matter of oh this one doesn't like blue so it must like this and like we ended up having we ended up donating this one but until they solved that puzzle they loved this game now, as an adult, this one was fun probably the first two, three times until as an adult I solved the puzzle and then I had to play the dad's not as smart as he is and let them win because I've solved the puzzle. Like, I know what I should do to win. So I recommend this one when the kids are young enough that they won't quite solve it. And although it's obscure, you can get it right now on Amazon yeah. uh, for, you know, 30, 38 bucks plus shipping and you can even have it by Christmas. Yep. Yeah, this one still exists. It's it's still out there. I actually thought you'd be able to find Flower Gardener, or else I might not have recommended that one. There was another game. Now, maybe Ancient Games will remind me. There was another game we were going to put on the list. but it, Oh, there. Okay, going back, since since we've already put on a game that you'll never find unless you go on German eBay, I'll throw another one out there. This isn't on the blog post. My kids love this game. We found this at Scholar's Choice, and it's called Laundry Jumble. Now, this is going back to toddlers. So it is a big cloth laundry laundry um bin or whatever laundry machine washing machine and in it are all these articles of clothing so there's like a jacket a pair of pants uh the my kid's favorite was the underwear um there was a pair of socks and the thing was they were all different textures so then you had a bunch of cards and you would shuffle the cards and you flip it up and there were animals wearing these pieces of clothing and what the kid had to do was reach in the into the laundry thing and pull out the appropriate piece of clothing and then if they got it right, they got to keep the card. First kid to get the three cards wins. My kids love this game. It was really well done because each of the pieces of clothing had something that kind of made them feel like one of the other ones. So it wasn't just a matter of I need to find the rough one because I'm looking for, I can't remember what the rough thing was, or I need to find the wool one because I'm looking for mittens. You'd feel it like, oh, it kind of feels like the mitten, but it might be the underwear. So it wasn't as simple as you could instantly tell what it was, but once you got good at it, you could feel more. This was a fantastic early tactile game for the kids to teach them different textures. I am really strongly recommend it, but long been discontinued. So I figure I've already put one on the list, so you may as well have two. Yeah, that one's a little frustrating because all the websites for it are still up. And so it looks oh, like God. you're going to be able to get it. And then you, you hit the link and it says it's discontinued. So that one's uh, annoyingly frustrating because, again, all those links show up like it's like you're going to be able to buy yep. it until you've clicked through. Yeah, we did. We did that research basically when we were working on the blog post. But I didn't do that with Flower Garden because I just assumed Flower Garden was out there. My bad. Yep. So moving on. So early grade school now. So most of these games now are, are ones my kids still play, right? These are games that we have. Um, the adults will generally happily play with the kids or without. Like once you get to this grade level, you're getting into, I don't want to say real games, but you're no longer looking at the targeted just at kids games. So last week I talked all about Blockus. I think that was last week. Might have been two weeks ago. Nonlinear podcasting. I forget now. It was at least last week, maybe two weeks ago, I talked about Blockus. Great abstract game, all about trying to play all of your uh, polyominoes onto a board while making sure your opponents can't do the same. 
I'm not going to get into Blockus again, but my kids love it. I love it. We play regularly. Uh, they've actually bought that one for me as a gift to play with me, which is pretty cool. Uh, another great one that's, again, tile laying that my family loves is Ingenious. Now, this is one Enchi Games plays with Big G pretty regularly. And if I remember correctly, they even went on to start playing the app together. Uh, that way they didn't have to set up the board. This is a fantastic Rainier Nizia game where you're matching colors and patterns. But the scoring is very unique. And that's where, depending on your kid, where it'll go. Like, I could easily play Ingenious with Little G, but she would not get the scoring. Because only your worst color is what you're scored in. Whereas Big G totally grocks it, gets Ingenious, and pro probably beat me most times when we play. Now, another abstract game, again with tiles, is Quirkle. So this is another one I find kids really dig, even, again, if they don't get the scoring. So Quirkle in particular is one where it has Scrabble-like scoring, and then you get a bonus if you manage to build, uh, use all your tiles, not all your tiles, but I can't remember how many. There's only so many colors and so many shapes. If you're able to play all of the shapes or all of the colors in one thing, you make a Quirkle and get bonus points. And to be honest, right now, I don't even remember what those bonus points are. So the kids probably aren't going to get that, but this is a great game where they're going to have a hand of tiles and play them out. And it's so much simpler than Scrabble because you're not worrying about two times word score, three times word score, board position. You're all just building off a central playing area where you're adding tiles to what's already there without having to worry about the limits of a board. There you go, random scrub 23.0. It's six of a row. So if you're able to pull, play a full row of six, so play five of your tiles because one would already be on the board, you get a quirkle and you get six bonus points. See, I thought it was way more for a quirkle. But anyway, uh, kids probably won't grok scoring, but they will grok the gameplay. You might even be able to start this one younger as long as you're not worried about tracking all the score. There's also uh, a number of games out there, and I, and I wish I'd uh, I wish I'd gone through this sooner. We've got a game somewhere in my collection that's uh, it's a path based game, but it's actually numbers and paths. Uh, and there's a bunch of different levels you can play. The basic game is basically uh, it's hexagonal tiles, pa um, path building um, with colored paths. But then there's also numbers on the tiles that allow you to. Um, to, to play additional games with it. And I again, I, gotta, I have to pull it out. We've got a couple of sets, so you can actually expand it. Uh, I think it, it's up to like 100, 100 different tiles or something like that. But anyway, wow. any, any sort of uh, uh, path, laying, path laying tile game um, is really kind of great at this age. Yeah, I would, uh, for hobby games, I'd probably recommend Soro. It's not one I have on my list. Uh, I've never actually tried it with our kids. I'm sure they'd probably dig it. I just never actually broke it out. Uh, tracks is so, another one too. Yeah, I've heard of that one. So similar to Kids at Carcassonne, so another big mass market game simplified for kids, there is a Catan Junior. And this is another good version. This is a, a, a great kids version of a Euro game. Unlike Carcassonne, I find this one's closer to the original. Uh, you're rolling dice to generate resources. It's your pirates in this one. And you're trying to set up pirate layers in a string of Caribbean islands. Uh, it has all the resource trade resources. Sorry, not all the resources, but it has all the resource trading and building of the original, but simplified down. Like, I think there's only three different resources and a wild card, and there's only three different things you can build. But you still have the stuff with the... Um, uh, development cards, they have that instead of their pirate cards. It's very much feels like a tan, but plays in about 15 minutes to half an hour and introduces trading, right? Uh, the basic mechanics of rolling dice generate resources. It, it gives you all those basics. And I, I would say if you have it, um, Catan chocolate, once you, uh, well, you know, once you're done with the chocolate <laughs> is a, is a really s nice simplified version of that game, uh, that, that would also, uh, be good for kids of this age. It's, yeah, it's I the basic. It. It's the basic. It once yeah. with the chocolate. Yeah, well, unfortunately, that you lose the you lose the chocolate advantage uh, quickly. But uh, the basic games and all the all the tiles, as long as they can handle those tiny little miniature. Yes, those pieces. little cards. They probably <laughs> there, there's a set of cards your son can hold. Yeah, those there you go. Hand resource cards. Uh, so one game that I owned long before my kids were born. Well, not long before, but before my kids were born, is a game called Hey, That's My Fish. Uh, this is a game my kids love. It's all about moving your penguins on a hex map. 
and collecting fish. So whatever square they move to, they get the fish on it. It's one, two, or three fish. But then the neat part is when they move off that hex, it sinks because it's supposed to represent sinking ice. Uh, this is a really great game with lots of long-term strategy planning as well as tactics where when your strategy doesn't work out, uh, it still keeps with a light, silly theme. But uh, this one, though, is not great if your kids don't get along because there is a lot of stabbing your neighbor in the back. Actually, that's kind of the, the whole point of the game is to try to cut off the other penguins so you can get all the fish. So as long as your kids can take that level of competition, I strongly recommend this one. I could see this one as being a fun game for them to make up their own game with as well. I mean, just the nice, big, colorful pieces and fun. If You know, this is one of those games where I'd say, hey, if you don't want to play it that way, just play with the pieces. <laughs> I yeah. like. I just yeah, love the, the components of, of it. Yeah. So it was around this age reign that uh, Entry Games and I discovered a series of amazing games from Playroom Entertainment. Uh, these are all very high-end games with very fancy boards, 3D pieces that tend to grow bigger than the box. Like you take the lid off and then you have to assemble some stuff to get these nice, very cool, almost centerpiece games. Uh, a lot of these use magnets to do cool things. Now, the best of the bunch we have found is Magic Labyrinth, which has the players running around an invisible maze trying to collect spell components. And by invisible maze, I mean literally you cannot see the maze. It uses a hidden maze that's hidden under the board and magnets to pull this off. So you take your pawn and you have to attach a magnet on the bottom. And it uses that trick you all did in grade school where you used a magnet under a piece of paper to move stuff. Well, the thing is you can't see the wall, so you go to move your piece. And if you knock the marble off the bottom, you walked into a wall. What's amazing is the tactile feel of this game. When you run into one of those walls, you can feel it. Like you feel the magnet hit this wall and you're like, oh, I hit a wall. It is so well done. Fantastic game. Now, other games in the same series include Magician's Kitchen, where you're trying to get ingredients into a cauldron without tipping. And again, it uses magnets, so your pieces are holding up. You put a little ball on their head, and when they move, they, there's a magnet that will cause the piece to tip over and drop what it's holding. And then there's Vampires of the Night, which we talked about during our Halloween episode. You know, there's something to be said about uh, the the wonder that is magnets for kids of a certain oh. age, certain kids, ju and certain kids, uh, you know, who, and especially if you're trying to interest them in science and things, uh, magnets are a true wonder that kids yes. will enjoy. Even if they don't like the game, uh, just getting them introduced to magnets can be a good thing on its own. Just be sure to talk to them about magnets and technology. Yes. Our kids, that's the one problem is now we have a, when we were kids, all you really had to worry about is bringing the magnet near the TV. Now we have a lot more tech in our house. They bring that near your thumb drives with your backup pictures from your wedding. It's not going to go good. Always teach the kids to keep the magnets away from the tech. That is something we have fought over, over the years. And if they, and, and, and do be careful because eating two magnets is one of the most dangerous things yes. that ever enters into an ER. Eating one magnet is actually rather safe. You'll poop out one magnet. If you eat two magnets, there is no way that that will come out of your body more or less. So just friendly little tip from someone who's got a wife, a wife who works uh, in a children's hospital. Two magnets, yeah. bad. <clears throat> Moving on to happier topics, though, we've got some <laughs> yes. we've got some mid grade school uh, where they're starting to read or uh, reading already. So here's where uh, King of Tokyo comes in. This is Little G's favorite game, and I honestly think this helped both of my kids learn to read. So we used to make it when we played King of Tokyo that they couldn't buy a power card unless they could read it out loud to us. And I think that really helped encourage them to read. There is another game I also credit, which is Forbidden Island, which the only reason that's not on this list is because it's a co-op game, and it was on our other list. So King of Tokyo is a kaiju king of the hill, giant monsters, king of the hill, trying to be the top of the thing. You're trying to be in Tokyo, and it uses Yahtzee-based dice rolling, right? Roll dice, keep as many as you want, re-roll, re-roll again, then spend your dice to do stuff. Uh, this one's just as good with adults. It is fantastic for large groups. One of the better games I had during bar night, but man, my kids love it. So I do have to admit, my kids take way too much pleasure in working together to take out mom and dad first. Now, one thing I'll say about the, when it comes to the reading, uh, again, we've talked as we've said a number of times, you know, every kid is going to develop on their own. 
One thing you want to watch out for, and it's a problem that I, I, I struggle with a little bit, is uh, my younger took to reading much faster. Uh, my, my older daughter has, has struggled and had some uh, difficulties that we've been working on. And you want to make sure that uh, we've always tried to make sure that the, the smaller one, the younger one, isn't in some way using that to his advantage or putting down or, or even, not, you know, incidentally uh, making the older one feel less or dumb or anything like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So just, you know, again, keep an eye on your kids. You know your kids. Uh, and just be careful that that balance is there and that no one is is feeling left out or, you know, under 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 ability without the ability that uh, the uh, the other one might have <clears throat> yeah thankfully for us why well, I, I wouldn't say thankfully but it's the younger who had more difficulty so it's kind of normal right that the younger kid would have difficulty i can see how that'd be more difficult the other way around so there are a lot of STEM, you know, uh, science, technology, education, math. I think that's what STEM stands for. And educational games out there. But sadly, most of the ones we've tried have not been good. Uh, again, we get to those activities. Again, great ways to learn things, but not the best games. Now, there is one we got the kids that actually went over really well, and that was Robot Turtles. Now, this is basic programming game, but it involves more than just move forward and turn left and turn right, move back. There actually are rules in the game for doing loops and subroutines. So we're talking real programming, which is cool. Uh, the included game and scenario is so-so, but what I really dig about this one is that my girls have taken it over. Uh, one will come up with a problem and set up the board and then explains the special rules, and then the other one has to write a, pro a program to solve it. So what I really recommend this one for is the emergent play that goes out of it. So if your kids are just going to follow the rules and play the scenarios in the rule book, probably not the best game. It's cool enough they'll have some fun with it. But if they can take that next step of going, well, I'll make my own scenarios, then it's a, a strong recommendation for me. Uh, along with that, uh, one thing, I guess it's not even technically a game, although my kids have actually gamified it. Uh, it's the Learning Resources Code and Go Robot Mouse. Um, I've seen that. It's a small little robotic mouse that you program much in the way we did with Logo back in the day, but by, by pushing buttons. Uh, and you can buy kits that give you mazes. So you can actually, one kid will set up a maze for the other one to program the mouse to go through. Um, cool. And it's been, it's been great fun. So that would be one of my recommendations. That sounds like it's on the tabletop. Sounds like a game. Uh, up next, I have Doodle Quest. This is a cool drawing game. We're back to Blue Orange Games with this one. But the cool part about this one is it's not based on how well you can draw. Uh, this one's hard to describe. If I showed it to you, get it right away. But trying to describe it, I'll try quick. You have a bunch of boards, a whole ton. They're two-sided. Each of them has, they all have an underwater theme. You put a board in the center of the table and then read the rules for that board. And every board's different. Then everyone takes their own acetone sheet and uses a dry erase marker to draw the thing that the board says. Now, the thing can be a pattern or shapes or lines, and it's based on what it shows. So an example could be the board in the middle shows three fish on it, and the rules are draw a circle around the three fish. Well, the thing is, you're just holding your board here and the board's like your sheet here and the board's over there on the table. So you are trying to guesstimate where you're drawing. Another example might be, here's a boat at the top and here's five fish at the bottom and you need to draw lines down that are fishing lures and if you touch the fish, you each get two points. So you're doing whatever it says on the board, drawing it on your thing and then you're, in turn, you're going to go around and put your sheet over the original board and see how well you did. It's very well done and way more fun than I thought it would be when I heard about the game playing this. People are laughing and having a great time with this. It Some parts of it somehow feels like a video game, especially there's one where you're trying to go through a cave and not touch the walls. I don't know, something about it reminds me of old school side scrollers. I really dig this game my kids dig it though i gotta admit it's been a while since they broke it out but i don't know if that's just a matter of they forgot it was on the shelf or if they actually are tired of it good to know and that one sounds fun especially when you can have that drawing and you don't need to worry about who's the artist again my, my kids yes. are, are very different i've got one who's very stem oriented one who's very art oriented um and so the fact that that doesn't change the game for them essentially um no, exactly. makes it for a great idea 
So going to some mass market games, games you should be able to find everywhere. So once your kids start reading, that's when you can break out the the word-based games, right? So you got your Boggle and your Bananagrams. I mentioned it before. I do not recommend Scrabble uh, just because the scoring's weird, right? And you got to teach them all the special spots and they got to worry about letters being worth different points. Whereas Boggle, it's just pure number of words. Bananagrams, it just use up all your tiles. Uh, these are great encouragement to read. And actually at this point, I think Big G could probably beat me every time so i generally leave these games for her to play with her mom uh for, for us it's upwards is actually the the scrabble variant to, that we prefer um and, and it's it's just that little bit easier where because you've got more abilities to play you don't have to have that whole word you can stack up and cre to create new words uh and allows a little more variation in that way yeah, I think Enchi Games grew up with upper words. That was one that was in her house, and I remember when we were dating, she, her showing it to me, and I wasn't personally a big fan. I don't know if she's tried that one with the kids. She may mention it in chat. So at this age, this is pretty much the age my kids are at now. This is basically when I introduce my kids to RPGs, right? Role-playing games. We talk about tabletop, not just board games. Uh, the first one I tried with my girls was a game called Mermaid Adventures by Third Eye Games, uh, written by Eloy LaSanta. This is a fantastic RPG for little kids. Um, for one, the theme. Like the whole mermaid theme, if your kids have seen Little Mermaid, and which kids haven't, they're going to get it right away. They're going to totally understand what's going on with a king and a queen and a princess all in underwater Atlantis. Uh, one of the things the kids loved was there was a life pass system where it rolled up what color their eyes were and how many friends they had. They loved making their own characters. And then when we got to the actual game, it's a ridiculously simple D6 based system that both kids enjoyed. They were both easy, able to grasp it, even the younger one, when we first introduced it. So once we played Mermaid Adventures twice, uh, Big G started I, it, between the two of us i started hinting at the fact that i think she should run a game herself and i let her read the books and she was reluctant at first and i asked why and she's like well because that's your game that's daddy's game and I'm like, well do you want your own game and she's like yeah if i had my own game i'd run it so i bought them the tales of equestria which is the my little pony role-playing game and my kids love my little pony They're, they've started now to move on dragon riders was bigger for a while i don't to be honest i'm not sure what their new hot netflix show is now but for years there it was my little pony everything was my little pony and big g devoured these books like really devoured them and like, I, I think I shared the picture where she came downstairs with the out of there had to be 100 post-it notes stuck in this rule book for all the different rules she wanted to remember. And she's really digging getting to be the GM. And I got to say, I don't think there's a much better gamer dad moment than sitting down at your daughter's table when she's about to run her first ever RPG. Like, you, you can't really beat that one. Absolutely. Uh, and I mean, I have to understand, I have to say, I understand it. Uh, I can't imagine playing Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay uh, with you sitting at the table. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. There we go. <sighs> there you go. Uh, so I would love to keep going, uh, getting into late grade school, possibly even high school. But this list that we've been talking about is based on my personal experience gaming with my kids. And well, my kids aren't there yet. So uh, the only thing I'll leave you with is what I plan on introducing next. So this year, Under the Tree, the kids are going to find their first deck building game. Uh, that's going to be in the form of the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle. I expect Big G will really love this as she is obsessed with Harry Potter and the books. I think she's read all of them at least twice, if not three times now. Um, also, I had actually forgotten because Han Solo hasn't dropped it off yet. I picked up a copy of Stuff Fables. Now, both of those games are co-op, so we guess technically don't belong on this list. But oh well, I don't care. That's our next step. Uh, so Stuff Fables is a cooperative, I would almost call it a dungeon crawler, where you use minis on a map and you are playing stuffed animals trying to defend their kid. It looks fantastic. It's supposed to be a better version of um, Mice and Mystics. And Mice and Mystics was on our co-op list. It's something I strongly recommended. I hear Stuff Fables is even better. We'll find out. Uh, the other thing I'm thinking we may get to do this year for the first time is New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve. We have a, a tradition of playing Ticket to Ride with um, my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law. I'm thinking we can invite the kids to the table this year. They're probably old enough to play that with the adults. So the big thing that I think is going to happen now is I don't think I'm going to buy as many kids games because at this point, I don't think we need games targeted to kids. I think what's going to happen now is I'm just going to share more of the games I already love and own with my growing kids. 
I think it's going to be awesome to start sharing some of my favorite games with them. That's great. And I know uh, for my kids, uh, we're also getting bu- the, the Hogwarts Battle as well as the expansion pack. Uh, and then uh, we've got uh, Harry Potter Clue is uh, okay. hitting the table as well. And then I picked up a Minecraft card game that is probably going to be junk, but it's the kind of fun <laughs> throwaway game that Minecraft lovers, you know, well, we'll enjoy just because it's Minecraft, whether or not it's a good game or not. But uh, yeah, so those are the uh, the three games that we're getting uh, that they're, they're get they're getting under the uh, under the tree this year. Yeah, I haven't. I, I didn't bother with the expansion yet. I fear we'll try it. In this case, I didn't buy it ahead of time. Oh, there's been a ton of uh, ton of chat going on. Random Games has really loved uh, Monza, uh, Habba's first orchard. Uh, as their first game. I've heard that one's good. Uh, to ter- teach how to take turns and follow rules. Uh, and also loving Animal Upon Animal. Um, so, and uh, Angie Games mentions that you guys need a replacement copy because the kids have made off with all of your p- yes. <laughs> your pieces. We, we can only play three player. We can't play ours four player anymore. Something, I forget what, but one of the, one of the required pieces, I think a hedgehog went missing. <laughs> Plus, I, I just want another copy of it. Plus, there's expansions too, and I never picked those up. Uh, those are those are ones I've considered. One of the things uh, I, I've talked before about how I, I have a thing against paying full price for games. Um, Blue Orange now and then, but Haba and and uh, that other company, Blue Orange sometimes, but they, they do not put their games on sale very often. Haba especially. I think it's because they're all uh, imported at this point. All right. Uh, Will Chamberlain mentioned that Spinderella is a cool magnets game. Yeah, that's another one from Playroom. I've heard that one's really good. Uh, and Random Scrubs says chanted stuffed fables or bust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. I said that one's going to be under the tree. I had actually almost forgotten about that. Yeah, that, that one's sitting over in Detroit right now. Uh, and uh, a little little discussion there about uh, no no games should be having apps or apps. Uh, you know, stick with uh, just using your phone as a timer or something as a timer. Uh, I mentioned. Or uh, Google Home these days should all uh, yep. be, be able to uh, do your timer duties nice and easily. Well, this was a great talk. Be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice for other questions answered in blog form. Be sure to send us your questions over at the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Just a note, the Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level do get their questions bumped to the top of the list. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. A misdirected Mark. Join Phil, Chris, and Bob every Tuesday night at 8.40 Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. They just wrapped up their actual play of Numenera, so I'm not sure what they're going to move on to next week. Well, I think they're uh, they're just looking at chat, and they are actually taking, taking suggestions for games they can be playing in 2019. Uh, nice. Now- Brian Kurtz, thank you. Duran Barnett, thank you both for being a patron and for your question today. Joe Swick, thanks a lot. Steve D, thank you. Jeff Seuss, thank you very much. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. We started with a new uh, thumbnail this week, and we're going to be adding a little bit more polish on the YouTube starting next week. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.